Thank you. So uh, this is joint work with Kasper Green Larsen and Jesper Boos Nielsen, also from Aarhus University. Um, so welcome to the other half of the world of MPC, uh, information theory secure MPC. Um, and in, in some sense, th this talk is going to be about how different that half of the world is from what Abby just talked about. And, and, and the, the, the spoiler, I guess, is that it, it is indeed very different. In, 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 in some ways, at least. So, uh, as we all know, information theoretical secure MPC protocols, they're so great, low computational overhead, no FAT here, uh, best possible security guarantees, what's not to like. But as we also know, they're not so great because uh, you have to have many rounds and large communication complexity, at least as far as we know from the protocols that, that we know about. And a very important long-standing open problem is whether that is inherent, uh, those costs. So, so in this talk, we, we have some of the answers. Um, the, the spoiler here is that the communication is indeed inherent, uh, at least for some functions, but um, we don't have anything to say about the rounds. Um, so just to be explicit about what, is, what do I mean by communication overhead? So one trivial observation is that if you don't care about security, of course you can compute any, fu any function with communication complexity which is the size of the input. You just send all the inputs to one guy, he computes the function, and then if everybody gets output, of course, you should add the total size of the output because he needs to send the outputs back to these guys. But we'll only talk about functions with very short outputs here. Uh, also to, to avoid cases where the communication complexity is, is, is large for trivial reasons, just because someone has to get a large output. We don't really want to look at that. Um, so the question is, if you take an information theoretically secure protocol, must it communicate more than the input size? It is, is the most basic question. There is also probably a much harder question that says, what if the circuit size is much bigger than the input size? Must you then communicate more than the circuit size of the function? That's, that's not something we can say much about. We can say some things, though, but, but it, it, it really is a different question. Um, so our results, so the model first, we consider statistically secure protocols, synchronous network, and passive security, semi honest security. We assume secure point-to-point -point channels using the standard model here where the length of the message that you send always leads to the adversary. This is very natural because if you're ever going to implement a secure channel, you'll be using, well, whatever you're using, you, you shouldn't expect to be able to hide the length of the message from the adversary. Um, there are two models we consider. Honest majority, where the number of players n uh, is 2 times corruption threshold t plus 1, and also dishonest majority with pre-processing. There you can also get... Uh, information theoretic security, and here n can be t plus 1. What we show in both models is that for any number of players n, and for infinitely many input sizes s, there exists a function f with input size s bits, such that any protocol that computes f securely has to communicate at least some constant times n s bits. So that says that there has to be this, function, this factor n overhead compared to the input size. Okay. Um, and recall, just to make sure, this is not because every player has to compute a long input, because it has to receive a long output, because the outputs are, in fact, very small. Um, more is true. It happens to be the case that our functions have very small circuits, in fact, linear size circuits in the input size. So the results also, therefore, say, obviously, that some functions require communication n times the circuit size of the function. Um, so what this means, intuitively at least, is that if you have a general protocol construction that can compute any circuit securely, and if it does the same, the same approach to every circuit, whatever that means, then it must actually always have that factor n overhead because it has to have it by these results when it computes that, that function that we construct. Um, so in, in, in from that intuition, at least, it, it seems that we always stop with this, with, with this overhead here, at least for the, for, for the protocols that we know about. Um, for honest majority, we have a matching upper bound, n times the circuit size. Uh, that's motivated by the fact that previous results were off by a factor log n for circuits that, 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 that say for Boolean circuits, circuits over small fields. Um, for the pre-processing model, uh, there was already an upper bound shown uh, in a paper from 2013 by Ishaya Dal. So the upper bound is n times s bits of communication. Um, this requires exponential size pre-processed data but if you can live with that, then the pre-processing case is essentially settled. The answer is n times input size. Okay. Good. So uh, we also extend this to suboptimal threshold. Okay. So for this majority, what about n equals 2t plus s, where s can be greater than 1? So the corruption threshold is smaller now. Um, then the bound is what it was before, but divided by s now. 
And this is nice because this exactly matches what we can get uh, from, for upper bounds using packed secret sharing. So packed secret sharing is this, is this technique where you can share a vector of secrets, but the shares are still only one field element. Uh, and in this way, you can do a bunch of arithmetic operations in parallel for the communication cost of one, essentially. So this, 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 this gives smaller communication, but, but the price is that the threshold must be smaller, the corruption threshold must be smaller, and this exactly matches this, this, this lower bound that we get here. Okay, so before uh, diving into how we do this, um, let me just mention some, some, some related work. There's first of all this work by Shai et al. from 13. Uh, they prove lower bounds for two parties in the pre-processing model and, and this upper bound for the multi-party case that I mentioned. Then uh, there's a work by, I think, Data and, and the Pranapka hands. Um, they do a lower bound for three parties and perfect security. And that was actually the first result showing that communication sometimes has to be larger than the inputs, but only in that particular uh, case with three parties and so on. Um, there's a work from Eurocrypt 16, myself, Nielsen, Ostrovsky, and, and Rosen, where we show a lower bound on a number of messages. So some functions require you to send n squared messages. Everybody have to talk to everybody else, so to speak. Um, this, of course, means you have to send n squared bits also in particular, but that, that's, that's much smaller than, than, than our lower bound when the inputs are large. Uh, and then finally, there is another work from 16 uh, where we showed some lower bounds uh, for gate by gate protocols. So th those are protocols that work the way we're used to, that, that you, you compute the circuit, you do every gate by itself. There's a sub protocol that you want for every multiplication gate. Uh, and for that class of protocols, you can get very strong lower bounds, but of course only for that class of protocols. And we, we want to do something for arbitrary protocols. Okay, so um, starting point for, for the results is to look at two party private information retrieval. So. Uh, just to remind you what, is, what that is, there's a server, there's a client. The server has a bit string X. Uh, the client has an input, an, an index I that points to some position in the string X. And they, they talk, there's a transcript T that's formed. And at the end of the day, the client can compute the ith bit of X, while a server is not supposed to learn anything here. And, and the only very well known and straightforward fact that I need about this, this, this situation here is that if this protocol is perfectly secure, then from the transcript, the client can always compute all of X, no matter what, what the protocol does. This is very intuitive if you think about it. I mean, because of the privacy requirement, right? If the transcript misses information about some part of X, then the server could conclude that that's not the part that the client wants, right? So that, that this cannot be, all, all of X has to be there somehow, okay? Yeah, so that, that's the only thing I need you to remember from this slide, that in, in perfectly secure two-party peer, the client can always compute uh, the service input from the transcript. Okay. So now let's go to honest majority. Oh, by the way, I forget this. Yes, yeah, so in the following, I, I only talk about perfect security. All our results hold for statistical security also. They're essentially the same. You take the perfect secure result and you take a few small epsilons and subtract here and there and then, then you get the results. I, I will distribute small epsilons afterwards so you can do it yourself. Um, anyway, so honest majority, three parties is the first step. Uh, so the function we consider here is, is the following. So there's gonna be two parties on top, there's Snoopy and Lucy, and they have each uh, one bit string as input, X and Y. Uh, and Charlie Brown has no inputs, but gets the inner product of those two bit strings as the output, okay? And so we assume that there is a, a perfectly secure protocol for this, for this inner product function, which is secure against one passive corruption, okay? Good, so uh, you run the protocol and then there is some messages sent between uh, party one and party two, that's called T12, that, that, that transcript there, uh, which you can think about a, 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 as a random variable. And similarly, we have T13 and T23 that's sent between the other two parties. So the first, Pretty obvious observation is that since P2 has no output, should learn nothing new from the protocol, then of course, in particular, T12 has to be independent of X, the, the, the input of the other guy, right? Because you're not supposed to learn anything whatsoever. This is perfect security. Uh, that's pretty clear. So then with that observation, we now consider what's gonna happen if we run this protocol with a particular choice of the input Y. So let's set Y to be the all zero vector, except there's a one in the ith position. So if you do this, then of course, uh, the inner product of X and Y is going to be the ith bit of X, right, obviously. So 
That means that we can now construct ourselves a two-party peer protocol because we're simply going to glue those two parties together there and consider them as being the client. And then, of course, we have uh, Snoopy is still a server, has input X, and now these two guys together will learn uh, the bit of X with that choice of Y. Oh, but what did we say about two-party peer? We said that, that from the transcript of the protocol, which in this case is T12 and T13, the client can compute the service, the service input, X, right? So it means that you can compute X from T12 and T13. However, we just also said that T12 itself is independent of X. So from T12, you have no idea what X is. You bring in T13. Now all of a sudden, you know what X is. So that means that T13 must have contained enough information to determine X, right? So therefore, just, well, at least intuitively, it has to be at least as large as X. I should pass mention for those who know about the technicalities here. What we actually show here is bounds on the entropy of, say, T T13. And this then implies that the average communication complexity must be at least the entropy. But that's, that's a detail. OK, so that's fine. Uh, and then from this, we can lift ourselves one step more and do the, the um, yeah, OK. <laughs> Just the, the, this is the takeaway message from this slide. The guy who gets the output must communicate a lot. This is the only thing you need to remember. Okay. Um, so now, the general case. So here we have two T plus one parties. First, we have uh, like T incarnations of Snoopy. They look an awful lot like each other, but that, that, that's a good reason for this. Uh, you'll see. So they call P11 up to P1T. Uh, we have uh, also T Lucy's T P P21 uh, up to P2T, and we have one Charlie Brown, which is P3. So two T plus one parties all together. Um, Okay, and the inputs that we have here is each party has, each of the top row parties have uh, an, a bit vector as input, again, x1 up to xt, and also y1 up to yt are also bit vectors. Uh, and then in addition, every party has one bit as input, okay, namely b1, 1 up to b1t, and, and so on, and, and b3 for Charlie Brown, okay? Um, and the way we define the function is as follows, so we define a value z which is you concatenate all the x vectors. You concatenate all the y vectors and you take the inner product. That's called set. And then the outputs are defined as follows. Each party gets as output that inner product times his input bit. So the input bit selects whether you learn something or whether you learn nothing. Okay. And now again, the, 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 uh, that, that's, that's the function that, that we will prove a lower bound for. We assume a secure protocol for this function that's secure against t corruptions now. Okay. So um, again, we're going to hard code the inputs in a particular way so that things will behave nicely. Uh, one thing we can do is we can set all the BIJ, so all the input bits for, 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 these, for these top row guys up there, uh, will be zero, and only Charlie Brown's input there will be one. So he's the only one who learns something in that case. Um, so then we can, we can get a two-party protocol from this, right? Because we're going to glue all the Snoopies together, all the Lucys together. And then, then we get a three-party protocol where, because the original protocol allows for T corruptions, then any one of these three parties now can be corrupt. So that exactly mirrors the situation from the previous slide. It's exactly the same thing. Um, so remember, the guy who gets the output has to talk a lot, right? So, so in this case, when we hard code the inputs in this way, this guy must communicate at least um, uh, order S bits, where S is the total input size, so the combined length of all these vectors. Okay? Uh, but we can, of course, glue parties together in, in, all, in all kinds of ways. So we can also do something else. Like we can say, let's set uh, now B11 to B1. So the first incarnation of Snoopy gets the output, and nobody else gets anything. And then we also said y1 to be 1. I'll tell you why that is in a moment. So now we glue parties together like this. So, so we glue all the t minus 1 last incarnations of Snoopy together with Charlie Brown, and all the Lucy's are glued together. Now, what is going on? The protocol, of course, computes the same function as before. Namely, it concatenates all the x's, all the y's, does the inner product. But now because y1 is set to be 0, that wipes out, in fact, effectively the x1. Right? So, so what it does is, in fact, it computes the inner product of x2 up to xt concatenated and y2 up to yt concatenated. It's a little bit shorter, but essentially the same size as before. So, and, and, and that's the inner product that, 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 that the first incarnation of Snoopy will get. And now it's exactly the same situation again as the previous slide. So 
So therefore, um, a P11 now must communicate all the aspects. And as, as you can easily imagine, we can do exactly the same thing for all the players. So therefore, in conclusion, what we get here uh, is that, so, so just to sum, summarize what I just said, for each party, it holds that I can hard code the inputs in a particular way, such that this guy gets the output, and that party in that case must communicate uh, some constant times aspects. But the point now is that the communication pattern, including the length of the messages, cannot depend on the inputs, right? Because, because in this model, even an adversary who corrupts no one will see all, all, the, all the, the, the entire communication pattern, can, can do traffic analysis, and that should not reveal the inputs. So that means if sometimes some guy has to talk a lot, he has to do it all the time. If the fact that he talks a lot depends on the inputs, and it does here. So, so therefore, the total communication, in fact, has to be omega uh, n times s bits. Okay. So... Um, Note also that the function, of course, this is just an inner product. So, so you can certainly compute that using order s elementary bits. So the bound is also n times the circuit size of the function, as, as I promised before. Okay. Um, good. So, so that basically uh, sums up what we do for the honest majority case, where the threshold is full threshold. Um, for the, uh, for the case, I don't have time to talk in details about the case of suboptimal threshold and the case of... of um, dishonest majority with pre-processing. It's basically very similar ideas, but technically slightly different details. Um, if you have, I guess I can say that if, if you have a suboptimal threshold, what happens is that you can start uh, gluing parties together in small groups. And then you, so, so, so you kind of do the, 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 the transition from the multi-party case to this three-party case, which is still what you would use to, in, in two steps, first you glue some parties together, then you get something which is essentially full threshold for, for, the, for this uh, conglomerate of parties, and then, then you go the last step. That was probably not very clear, but I think from the paper it's hopefully clear. Okay, let's talk about the upper bound. So uh, for honest majority, there is in fact this, this result from crypto 07, uh, where, where I showed with, with, with Jesper Nielsen that any arithmetic circuit can be computed with passive security and honest majority, uh, and equal to equals one with communication uh, that's order n times circuit size field elements. Uh, so you might say, but that, that's exactly the lower bound, isn't it? It, it? So there's already a matching upper bound. But there's a catch, namely that this only works if the field size is, is larger than n. Okay. So if I want to compute the Boolean circuit, say, I can still do that with that protocol. I just need to run it with an extension field. Uh, I need to make it big enough that, that I can have n evaluation points in the field. Um, and so this means that I would have to put in a log n factor in, into the uh, communication complexity of this thing for a Boolean circuit. So if we can get rid of this thing uh, by using uh, a tool from last year. There is something called reverse multiplication-friendly embeddings. That's something that, that appears in the paper by Kramer et al. In, in, in crypto last year. Um, it's basically, the idea is that it's a way to take, uh, to implement many parallel multiplications in a small field by doing just one multiplication in a bigger field. So basically what, what you do is you, you take your, your two vectors that you want to pointwise multiply and you encode them using a special encoding function into two field elements in the bigger field. Then you multiply in the bigger field once and you get something which essentially encodes all these parallel multiplication results that, 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 that you actually wanted. Um, so, so then what we do is you combine these two things, you basically run the old protocol from 07 over the bigger field, and this then does what you want, essentially. Uh, you have to do some unpacking at the end, but that turns out to be only for one big field element that you have to do something non-trivial. So, so that basically gives you the, the, uh, the corresponding uh, upper bound. Okay, so let me um, go to open problems in future work. So there's ongoing work where, where we try, and I, I'm, 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 I would be very happy to, to receive any inspiration for this, that it would be nice to have lower bounds for also, let's say, naturally occurring functions. That is, functions that we haven't especially engineered to be able to prove the lower bound. And, and, and there, there might be ways in which functions naturally behave in sort of similar ways to what we engineered here. So that, that would be interesting. Um, a, a really tough question but also uh, 
immensely interesting question is, what if the circuit size is much bigger than the inputs? Is there a lower bound than that grows with the circuit size? This is a question of a completely different nature than, than the one we actually solved, which has to do with the input size. I mean, for one thing, if I give you a function, I mean, for most functions, we don't even know what the circuit size is, right? So, <laughs> without some kind of, 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 of assumption, we will certainly get nowhere here. And even then, I think it's, 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 it's really totally different techniques that you would need to do this. Um, for the pre-processing model, there's this uh, open problem left. So the existing upper bound says n times input size. That's for optimal threshold nst plus 1. Um, but what if we have suboptimal threshold? Then our bound degrades a little bit. It, it, it divides ns by this little s that, that, that appears. Uh, so this here gets divided by there. So lower bound gets smaller when the threshold gets smaller. Um, and we don't know whether we have an upper bound that can match that thing there. OK? Um, and finally, uh, something which used to be an open problem, but I think is now actually closed. Uh, so what about a lower bound for perfect malicious security? And any e equals 3, t, 3t plus 1. So you, you, you might think that, OK, malicious security should be easy, because that implies passive security. Just apply our bound. And this doesn't work here, because the threshold here, uh, right there, is, is, is n third. And we do something for n over 2. The threshold gets smaller, the bound degrades. So if you go all the way down to n over 3, our bound tells you have essentially nothing. So it turns out that there's a different argument that explicitly exploits the fact that we have malicious security, and it gives the same result. There are some details we have to check, but it, it, it seems to work out. And it, then you get the same result n times circuit size, as we have a passive security. And by coincidence, which is almost too good to be true, the next talk in the session, Goyal et al. will tell you that that's exactly the upper bound. So uh, that's, that's quite amazing. Uh, but uh, yeah, so that's what I had. But that I'll say thank you for your attention. Go ahead. So you use the fact that the communication channel leaks the size yeah. of the messages. Um, do you think the bound still holds if you have some sort of idealized channel that doesn't leak? I think so. So do, do the bounds still hold if, if the message links do not leak? I, I, think, I think we were maybe a bit lazy. I, I think we could still prove something, even without that assumption. Then, then we, you have to have an adversary that, that corrupts some of the players and, and watches what is being sent. And I, I, I'm pretty sure that could be worked out. So my question is the theorem statements you said are about average communication, the average complexity of a uh, protocol, right? Yeah. So could it be that uh, that average is basically due to, uh, you know, low probability events having extreme communication? I, I, can you make a statement about the variance and, and argue that there can't be some protocols that are actually pretty good, but their averages are large for obscure reasons? That's a good question. Um, I don't have a good answer to that. that. That would have to be, I think, a different study. Uh, I don't see anything that, that, that we have in the paper that would tell you directly what the answer to that one. Great. Thank you, Ivan. <laughs>